Shabbat Shalom. Happy Sabbath, everybody. Happy Sabbath. Welcome to the Philadelphia Assemblies. and Welcome me back. <laughs> I've been gone so long, I almost forgot my way back home. Uh, today, according to our calculation of the calendar, is the 12th day of the seventh month of the year 5778. Again, that's different than some because we're... Uh, keeping the full moon as the new moon per um, Psalm 81, okay, verse 3. And I know some would contend with that. I saw someone the other day on the Internet. Obviously, you know, we all have to be able to interpret it. Said that it was talking about a dark or covered moon in that sense. But when I, I spoke to the gentleman uh, via messenger uh, about how do you cover a dark moon with darkness, how can you reckon that? You know, when the scripture actually, if you look it up in the Strong's Concordance, says covered with light. And for it to be covered with light, it has to be a full moon. Okay? That doesn't mean we're right and everybody else is wrong. That just means what it says, okay, in the scriptures. We're gonna today's also the uh, sixth day of the tenth month, or October 6th, 2018, on the Gregorian calendar. So I'm gonna continue uh, my uh, expository teaching from the gospel according to Luke. This is part 10. It's just going to be one chapter because we're going to do a lot of connecting uh, scripture to uh, support the teaching. So, and Brother Jeremy Puchinata is going to be our reader today. He's going to read and he's got a lot of reading to do. So we're going to go ahead and turn and face where the temple was and where it shall be and open in prayer. Almighty Father God, we just thank you for another Sabbath day. We ask that you would pour out a blessing upon us and upon this day as you have from the foundation of the world. We ask that you would uh, open each, our, each of our hearts and our minds and show us the truth, Father, in your word, not based on opinions, Father, but on the scripture itself. Father, we ask that you would also pour out an extra unction of your spirit upon us and give us more understanding. Father, we ask it all in your precious Son, Jesus, or Yahushua's name. Amen. So, we'll go ahead and just jump right in. Chapter Luke, chapter 21. Luke, chapter 21. Kind of marking this a little bit, but I'll probably lose my marker, so you guys will have plenty of time to get to your scripture because it takes me a while with this real thin page Bible that I have, King James Bibles. Okay, we're, we'll go ahead and get started. This is going to start out um, talking about, uh, you know, giving or uh, tithing in some cases to to the uh, all uh, to the church or to the body. Of Messiah. I know there's all kinds of different opinions on that out there, and we'll just leave it at that. I'm just going to teach it from where I am and my understanding because that's all I can do. Okay, so if you don't agree, come to me with scripture. Don't come to me with conjecture because that's not going to happen with me. Okay, so Luke chapter 21, verse 1, and he, our Messiah, looked up. And saw the rich man casting their gifts into the treasury, or their alms. It was the Greek word equal to the Hebrew word. So their gifts in this case are free will offerings. But obviously there's more to be into this picture than just that. So in verse 2 says, And he, our Messiah again, saw also a certain poor widow casting in thither or in there two mites. So... A very small sum of money compared to what the rich man was casting in. And he, our Messiah, again said, Of a truth, I say unto you, this poor widow have cast in more than they all. For all these have of their abundance cast into the offerings of God. And this would be Theoe in the Greek or Elohim in Hebrew. But she of her pincher or her poverty hath cast in all the living that she had. So obviously it says if they gave of their abundance or of their wealth, they're probably talking about a tithe, probably a tenth part. 
Okay, so they gave up their abundance. So that abundance was a whole lot more than those two mites. But when you look at it in the sense that our Messiah looks at things, she had passed in every penny she had. She didn't have anything for her livelihood, and she had to fully depend on God for her existence. And it takes a lot of faith, and that's what our Messiah was talking about. You know, people have a hard time with turning loose a tithe. Especially nowadays, they you know they want to say, well, that tithe was for Jacob. I've heard that argument. But I also know that the scripture says that a tenth part of all is mine, and that's referring to YHWH or the Father. Okay? So we want to make sure we are in the right context with things, but we also want to use you know righteous judgment when we're reading the scripture as well. And some spake of the temple, and that'd be some that were with the Messiah. How it was adorned with goodly or fine or precious stones and gifts. He said, as for these things which you behold, the days will come in which there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now, we know that in 70 AD, this particular prophecy reaches a fulfillment. Okay? But we also know that wherever... There's a prophecy, there's they're secular, okay, and they get filled here, and they get filled a little more here, and then at the end, they'll be completely fulfilled. And since we're looking at overall here what we're talking about casting in a little, we, we could also look at some of this as talking about just a remnant being gathered here as well, because he's talking about the temple and how it'll all be rigged down, and at that time there won't be one stone laid upon another. Verse 7, and they ask him, saying, Master... But when shall these things be? And what sign will there be when these things shall come to pass? And he said, again, our Messiah, Take heed that you be not deceived. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, or the Anointed One. That's what Christ means. And the time draweth near. Go ye now, therefore, after them. In, uh, we all know that Matthew 24 is real is parallel to this and really you need to be able to kind of lay them side by side which is kind of hard to do sometimes but we're going to go back and we're going to read for a little more clarification we're going to matthew 24 and we're going to start out in uh verse three and read through six would you, when you get there brother would you go ahead and as and as he said upon and as he sat upon the mount of olives the disciples came unto him privately saying tell us when shall these things be and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world now let's stop right there you, what we sometimes fail to see is they ask two questions in a question they asked him first okay what would be shall be the sign of thy coming talking to our messiah as when he's coming and then they added to that and of the end of the world two separate events now, there's going to be an end of the reign of man here on earth after a 6,000-year reign from Adam all the way up until our Messiah returns at his second coming. And after that, we'll have a 1,000 years here on earth, and then, we'll have, then the end will come. So they ask two separate questions. And you have to understand when you're reading Scripture, they might have more than one conclusion that has to be met that is basically saying the same thing. Just so we uh, have that. Go ahead, bro. Verse 4. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And he's talking about his coming here, because there has been many people came in his name already. And some recently came and say they are the new Messiah. So you have to realize many false messiahs would come in his name. They came prior to him being here. Matter of fact, that's one of the reasons why they had such a hard time. A lot of the Israelites had a hard time recognizing him because so many had already come and say they were the Messiah and came in that name. Go ahead, brother. Verse 6. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Now, that's very important to understand. You know, there's been wars and rumors of wars since the beginning of time. You know, Basically, ever when the second man was on earth, there was a conflict starts, 
And that conflict has continued right up until the return of our Messiah. So it's, under, it's, it's important to understand all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Uh, a lot of people, you know, they'll read and they'll think our Messiah, his reign is without end. But let's go to uh, Luke chapter 22 and read verse 37, brother. Yes, sir. You said Luke, so I thought you were just going to read. No, no, no. Just one verse for me in Luke, please. Verse 37. For I say unto you that this, that this that is written must yet be accomplished in me. And he was reckoned, and he was reckoned among the transgressors, for the things concerning me have an end. Now, he was quoting Isaiah chapter 53. We're not going to go back there and read that. But we are going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we're going to start in verse 23, and, and, and Brother Jeremy's going to read, and we're going to get the order of things, okay? We could also go to uh, Revelation chapter 20 and 21, and we'll get the exact same order. We don't have to go there, but we could. Go ahead, brother. 1 Corinthians. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward... They that are Christ said is coming. Okay, so let's we got that part. We get the order of that. Okay, we know that first Christ came and then he died for the transgressions of the world, like we just read in Luke chapter 22, verse 37. He said he, he, he was count. Let's read, let me go back to that. 22. I want to read that again. Excuse me, I wasn't I didn't have that written down to go there, it just came to me to go there. Okay. It says, For I say unto you that this is that that is I'm sorry, for I say unto you that this that is written must yet be accomplished in me. Okay, and that prophecy was in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 12. Okay, and he was reckoned among the transgressors. See, that's what I was talking about, what it's talking about over here in its own order here. First Christ, the first fruits of them that slept, he was raised. But first he was offered and became transgression for us. Okay? So we need to understand that he was without sin, but he became sin for us so that we wouldn't all have to suffer and die. That doesn't mean once you receive that that you can sin willfully so grace may abound. It just means you get a clean start and a new slate. And from that point over, you have to be repentant. And that means to not only be regretful of what you did in the past, but also make changes and start living according to the word of God and not according to what's right in your own mind. Go ahead, brother. Verse 24. 24. Then come at the end. When he shall have delivered up the kingdom of God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. Okay, so we know that before the, the reign of Christ, when he first comes back, the first things he's going to do is put down all principalities, all powers, and he's going to set up a kingdom here on earth, and he's going to reign for exactly a thousand years according to the scripture. I believe that his reign will start on a day of atonement, and it'll end on a day of atonement, but... That's that there is obviously conjecture from what reading the scripture. I'll I'll sum that up at some other point in time because I got enough to cover here already and I want to keep this as short as possible. But so Christ comes his second time, and after he puts down we put he puts down all authority and all power, he's gonna reign that thousand years, and then what then it says he will have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father identifying who he's talking about, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and all power. Go ahead, brother. Verse 25. For he must reign until he hath put all enemies under his feet. Okay, in Psalm 110, verse uh, 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 1, it's talking about that all his enemies shall be put down. So the last thing to be put down is going to be death. And it says that here in 1 Corinthians 15. We don't have to read that far. So the last thing that has to be conquered is death. What we need to understand is that's not going to be conquered till after the thousand years because people are going to be living and dying and doing the, uh, just, you know, going on during that thousand year reign just as they are now. And I believe they'll be living longer periods of time. But again, that's just opinion from the scripture. So for he must reign. That's talking about our Messiah must reign till he 
And that's talking about the Father hath put all enemies under his feet. Okay, under the under Messiah's feet. Verse 26. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Right. And that's what Psalm 110 1 says. Go ahead, brother. Verse 27. For he hath put all things under his feet. But when he but when he saith all things are under him, it is manifest that he is expected, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son of also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. That's very good, Jeremy. And I think everybody probably understands that, but I'm going to break that down a little bit further. For Again, for he hath put all things. And we have to understand that one that put all things under his feet was the Father, because behind him is all the power and everything that comes. And then it says, but when he saith, the Father, all things are put under him, the Son. It is made known or manifest that he is accepted, which put, which did put all things under him. Okay? And that's important to understand that the Father put everything under Messiah's feet. He, it was his inheritance. It was expected to have it. And then at the end of that thousand year reign, he's going to put it, give it back to the Father where it came from in the first place. Okay? And then in verse 20, was it 28? And when all things shall be subdued under the Messiah, then shall the Son, I mean, or the Father, I said that wrong, when all things are under subjection to the Father, then shall the Son also himself be subject to him, the Father, that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. See, there's an order of things. And a lot of times we get to thinking things are to be fulfilled before Messiah comes that necessarily won't be completely fulfilled until the end comes. Because going back to what we were talking about, they asked two questions in Matthew 24. And this is uh, Luke 21 is just Luke's recollection. Or absolutely, obviously, Luke really wasn't there. It was a secondhand opinion, but it's pretty close to what was being recorded in Matthew 24. But we have to understand they were talking about two separate things. And our Messiah was telling them both when he would return and when the end would come in these statements. Okay. So now let's go to, I'm going to go back to Luke chapter 21. Luke 21, and I'm going to pick it up in verse 9. Okay. But when you shall hear of wars and commotions, pretty much the same thing we just read in Matthew 24, ru ru wars and rumors of wars, be not terrified or afraid. For these things must come to pass, but the end is not by and by, okay, or not yet, as it says in Matthew 24. Okay, I'm not sure. okay one more verse. Then said he unto them, Nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And this is where you have, this is where we're going to get a comparison here. We're going to go back to Second um, Chronicles chapter 15, and Brother Jeremy's going to read verse 1 through 6, and we're going to see these same words were mirrored at a different time. And that's just to show that prophecy is secular, or it happens, and it happens, and it happens before the final Conflict. Okay, go back to uh, First Chronicles, Second Chronicles. You there, Jim? Yeah. Go ahead, bro. And the Spirit of God came upon Nazaria, the son of Oded, and he went out to meet Asa, and unto him, and or and said unto him, Hear me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you, while ye be with him. And if ye seek him, he will be found of you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. Now, for a long season Israel hath, get, or hath been without the true God, and without a teaching priest, and without law. But when they in their, in their trouble did turn unto the Lord God of Israel, and sought him, he was found of them. And in those times there was no peace to him that went out, nor to him that came in. But great vexations were upon all the inhabitations of the countries. And nation was destroyed of nation and city of city, for God did vex them with all adversity. Be ye strong, therefore, and let not your hands be weak, for your work shall be rewarded. And when Esau heard these words, 
and the prophecy of Odin, the prophet, he took courage and put away the abominable idols out of all the land of Judah and Benjamin and out of the cities which he had taken from the Mount Ephraim and rewarded er, and renewed the altar of the Lord that was before the porch of the Lord. And he gathered all Judah and Benjamin and, and the strangers with them out of Ephraim and Manasseh and out of Simeon. For they fell to him out of Israel in abundance when they saw that the Lord his God was with him. So they gathered themselves together at Jerusalem in the third month, in the fifteenth year of the reign of Asa. And they offered unto the Lord the same time of the spoil which they had brought, seven hundred oxen and seven thousand sheep. And they entered into a covenant to seek the Lord God out of their father, or to seek the Lord God of their fathers with all their heart and with all their soul that whosoever would not seek the Lord God of Israel should be put to death, whether small or great, whether man or woman. And they swear unto the Lord with a loud voice, and with shouting, and with trumpets, and with cornets. And all Judah rejoiced at the oath, for they had sworn with all their heart, and sought him with, all their, with their whole desire. And he was found of them, and the Lord gave them rest round about. And also concerning... Maacha, Maacha, the mother of Asa, the king, he removed her from being queen, because she had made an idol in a grove. And Asa cut down her idol and stamped it, and burnt it at the brook Kidron. But the high places were not taken away out of Israel. Nevertheless, the heart of Asa was perfect all his days. And he brought into a house of God the things that his father had dictated and that he himself had dictated silver and gold and vessels. And there was no more war until the five and thirtieth year of the reign of Asa. Okay. I think that was a little bit more than what we needed, but that's okay, yeah. because that all fits into what we're going to be reading in the rest of Luke 21. Okay? Notice in this reading that any of them that turned their heart to God, he was found. Okay, to the Father. When they turned to Him, they were found. And when they turned away or they didn't keep His commandments, they weren't found. And that's no different now. I mean, right now we don't have a teaching priest. Okay, we don't have Israel and Levi or the sons of Aaron sitting in those seats because we don't know for sure who they all are. Okay, so we're at the same time. We don't have a teaching priest, but we do have those that are called. And we're going to be taught, we're going to look at that as we go through here. We're not going to go through a whole lot to one way or another that, but that with this, you can see those that turn to God with their whole heart, he was found. That's not change. Okay? That's always been the case. So now we're going to go back to uh, Luke uh, 21, and we're going to pick it up in 11. Okay? Read through 24. You'll see how that all fits as we go along, and we'll read Isaiah some here in different places, and we'll see all this fit together. Because these prophecies, again, are secular, or they're step by step by step to they're completely fulfilled at the end. Okay? So, Luke chapter 21, I'm going to pick it up in verse 11. And great earthquakes shall be in, the, in divers or various places, and famines and pestilence and fearful sights, and great signs shall be from, shall be from heaven. We're not without those kind of things going on right now, but they've been going on since the beginning. They were going on when these prophecies were fed, set back in Chronicles. There were sights and wonders that they saw both in the heavens because all of prophecy is found both in the feasts and in the heavens, according to Scripture. Okay, So all these things were going on. You see them now. Look all across the, the globe, all the abominations and different things that are happening. These things are going to happen but the end is not yet, as it says in Matthew 24. Okay, then it says, "But before all these, before all these, they shall lay their hands on you." And now this is this is talking about Israel. Okay, proper. Okay, because now this may very well happen to the commonwealth of Israel before the end comes. But at this particular prophecy is talking about when they before 70 A.D. when all the People came in and destroyed the temple. They laid hands on them. Let's listen to the rest of it. It says, but before all these, 
they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you. And they've been doing that, and they're going to continue to do that. That's not going to stop, okay? Delivering you up to the synagogues. That we haven't seen as much of that, but it's going to happen. And into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my namesake, okay? Because Israel is God's namesake, okay? And it shall turn to you for a testimony to them. A testimony of all the promises of the curses that would come because of turning away from God. Okay, we're going to continue to read. Okay. okay. Settle it, therefore, in your hearts. In other words, accept it. It's coming. There's not anything they can do about it. Not to meditate before what you shall answer. Because for I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries shall be unable to gainsay or to contradict nor resist. And you shall be betrayed both by parents and brethren and kinsfolks and friends. And some of you shall they cause to be put to death. That's already been happening and it'll continue to happen. Sure, it happened with physical Israel. It'll probably happen with those grafted in as well as we draw closer to that day when a when our Messiah comes for the second time. But there shall not a hair of your head perish. Now, we're not going to go back there. That's referring back to Jonathan in 1 Samuel chapter 40, uh, 14, verse 45, because Jonathan was keeping the commandments of God, and he was setting an example, and it was said that not one hair on his head, God said, would fall, and that's the comparison. And it's no different now. If you're keeping... God's commandments, if he has a, if you have a message to deliver, you've got a hedge around you. You've got protection, okay? And that's what that's talking about. But there shall not a hair of your head perish in your uh, patience process, you, uh, you, your souls, or your lives. And when you shall see Jerusalem, did I, oh, yeah. and when you shall see Jerusalem surrounded with armies, now, they saw that in 70 A.D., Okay, and they may very well see that again many times before the end comes. But in Revelation chapter 20, it talks about the holy city being surrounded by the camp of the saints when they're there keeping the feast. And that's what this would be referring to in, in this, in the final uh, play out of scripture. Because again, remember, prophecy is secular. Then let them which are in Judah flee to the mountains. And let them which are in the midst of it depart out, and let not them that are in the countries therein too, okay, enter therein too. For all these day, all these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. Now, obviously, that was there was things fulfilled back when they raked the temple in 70 A.D. There was things that were wrote, uh, fulfilled back when they destroyed the first temple. Solomon's temple. It's secular. It just continues to happen. But in the very last days, they're not going to rape the temple, but we can see these same things in Scripture. And remember, we're talking about the end as well as the return of our Messiah. But woe unto them that are with child, and woe to them that give suck in those days. For there shall be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. Now, we know that happened way back. We're going to read some about that. But we also know that it happened in 70 A.D. And it's going to happen again. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles. This is talking about 70 A.D. in this particular instance. They're talking about the temple being trodden down by the Gentiles. And it says, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Has that time ended? Is it No. The Gentiles are still ruling the world right now. The nation of Israel is not ruling the world. Okay? So, let's go back to Isaiah chapter 63, Jeremy. And read 1 through 18. And let's kind of get a mirror on this. Who is this that cometh from Edom? with dyed garments from Bozrah, that this is glorious in his that this that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I that speak in righteousness 
mighty to save. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments, thy garments, like him that treadeth in the wine fat? I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the people there was none with me, for I will tread, for I will tread them in mine anger, and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. For the day of vengeance is in mine heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. And I looked, and there was none to help, and I wondered that there was none to uphold. Therefore mine own arm brought salvation unto me, and my fury, it has upheld me, or it upheld me. And I will tread down the people in mine anger, and make them drunk in my fury. And I will bring down their strength to the earth. I will mention the loving kindness of the Lord, and the praises of the Lord, according to all that the Lord hath bestowed upon us. And the great goodness toward the house of Israel, which he hath bestowed on them, according to his mercies and according to the multitude of his loving kindness. Now he did that all along, even though when Israel was disobedient, he did it, he protected them. He he did all those things. He had loving kindness for Israel. Go ahead, brother. For he said, Surely there they are my people, children that will not live. Lie. Or children that will not lie. So he was their savior. In all their affliction he was afflicted. And the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity he redeemed them. And he bare them and carried them all the days of old. See, now this is talking about how the, from the very beginning, from Jacob all the way till they got rejected, how he held them up and how he protected them. And all these things are connected together. Go ahead, brother, verse 10. But they rebelled. Rebelled. They rebelled. And vexed his Holy Spirit. Therefore, he was turned to be their enemy, and he fought against them. See, that, that, and that's what did happen. That's why, they, you know, that Israel was cut off from God. They even got another opportunity when our Messiah walked on earth. They got the opportunity to accept him. But they rejected him again. And at that time, point in time, the nation, not individually, but the nation, obviously, everybody that walked in his commandments all those years are still in covenant. They died in covenant. They're, they're going to be in the first resurrection. But the nation as a whole did not do that. Okay? And that's why God vexed them. Okay? He turned upon them. And then he poured out his wrath upon them. Okay? Go ahead, brother. Verse 11. Yes, sir. Then he remembered the days of old, Moses and his people saying, where is he that brought them out of the sea with the shepherd of his flock? Where is he that put his Holy Spirit within him, that led them by the right hand of Moses with his glorious arm, dividing the water before them to make himself an everlasting name, that led them through the deep as an horse in the wilderness, that they should not stumble? As a beast goeth down into the valley, the Spirit of the Lord caused him to rest. So didst thou lead thy people to make thyself a glorious name. Look down from heaven, and behold, from the habitation of thy holiness and of thy glory, where is thy zeal and thy strength, the sounding of thy bowels and the mer and of thy mercies toward me? And they restrained? Are they restrained? Are they held back? Yeah, they are. Go ahead, brother. Doubtless thou art our father through Abraham, be ignorant of us, and Israel acknowledge us not. Thou, O Lord, art our Father, our Redeemer. Thy name is from everlasting. Now, let's look at what's going on here. There's a lot being said, and sometimes we just read over stuff, kind of top surface the deal. Notice that he's talking about the nation of Israel, and then he's saying we. Okay? Because the whole nation of Israel as a whole, not individually, sinned against God and was cut off. But he's talking about himself in the third person, Isaiah, second person here, saying we. Okay? So he says, look down from heaven and behold from the habitation of your holiness and your glory, where is your zeal and your strength, the sounding of your bowels and your mercy toward me. Are they held back? Talking, you know, towards the people of Israel. Yeah. 
They've been held back because not keeping His commandments. Doubtless thou art our father through Abraham. Be ignorant of us, and Israel acknowledge us not. Well, wait a minute. If we're just talking about the nation of Israel, why does he say Israel regards us not? Because he's talking about the prophets. That's what he's talking about. That's the we in this. These are the ones that are coming to Israel as a nation and warning them that they're going to be cut off. Okay? So you can see this in the in the actual, as it's written down. Then it says, he says, Doubt Abraham, be ignorant of us, and Israel acknowledge us not. Talking about the prophets. Thou, O Lord, or YHWH, art our Father, our Redeemer. Thy name is from everlasting. Again, YHWH, why hast thou made us to err? See, they're blaming God because of their error from thy ways and hardened our hearts from thy fear. Okay, he allowed that, but he didn't make them do that, I assure you. Return for your servants' sake, the tribes of thine inheritance. And he, there's a promise that's going to be done. Okay, that's going to be done. When, when our Messiah comes back, he's going to bring the, both the houses of Israel, the northern and southern tribes, through Judah and Ephraim. Okay, those two are going to become one in his hand. So, And that's Ezekiel uh, chapter 37. And you have to understand that those promises are going to be fulfilled. This is what he's asking in thine inheritance. Then in verse 18, it says, The people of thy holiness, he's talking about Israel, have possessed it but a little while. In other words, they didn't have it for the length because they rejected God and his commandments and got cut off. Our adversaries have trodden down thy sanctuary. That's the Gentiles, okay, that knocked down the temple, okay? This happened more than once in history, okay? That's why I'm telling you, history is secular. It continues to happen until the final play. And he says, we are thine. He's talking about the prophets. Thou never bearest us. Wait a minute. This here is talking about the nations. We are thine. Thou never bearest us rule over them. They were not called by thy name. Okay, so it's Israel, and it's talking about those Gentiles that are going to be, and that's talking about the time of the Gentiles that we were just reading. So I might have got my tongue tangled up, but I hope you got the gist of what I was talking about. Okay, now we're going to go back to... Uh, One minute, yeah, go ahead. I thought you did. I no. thought I did. Go ahead, read it. No. Finish it. Verse 17. O Lord, why hast thou made us to err from thy ways, and harden our heart from thy fear? Return for thy servants' sake, the tribes of thine inheritance. The people of thy holiness have possessed it but a little while. Our adversaries have trodden down thy sanctuary. Okay, thank you. Now we're going to go back to uh, Luke chapter 21. Uh, and we're going to pick that up in uh, verse 25. Now... We see all that's going on there. Now let's pick up what Messiah is talking about in chapter 26 and how this all relates. Men's hearts failing them for fear. Remember he was talking about earlier, but their fear was taken away. They didn't fear God, but that's going to get returned. Okay? And he, then he says, men's heart failing them. Um, I, I, I started too late, didn't I? Verse 25. 25. Thank you. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and the stars and upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexities, the sea and the waves roaring. Now, we're going to, now we're going to read Isaiah chapter 13, 1 through 10, make another connection with the book of Isaiah. Are you there, bro? Yeah. Go ahead, brother. The burden of Babylon, which Isaiah the son of Amos did see. Lift, lift ye up a banner upon the high mountain. Exalt the voice unto them. Shake the hand, that they may, that they may go into the gates of the nobles. I have commanded my sanctified ones. I have also called my mighty ones for mine anger, even them that rejoice in my whole, in my highness. The noise of a, a multitude in the mountains, like as of a great people. 
a tumultuous noise of the kingdoms of nations gathered together. The Lord of hosts muster, mustereth the host of the battle. They come from a far country, from the end of heaven, even the Lord, and the weapons of his indignation to destroy the whole land. How ye, for this day, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It is come as a destruction from the Almighty. Now, the destruction, complete and utter destruction, is going to come when the when the earth burns up in a fervent heat. Go ahead, brother. Therefore shall all hands be faint, and every man's heart shall melt, and they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrows shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth. They shall be amazed one at another. Their faces shall be as flames. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh cruel, both in wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. Now think about what's all being said here. You know, we obviously know that there's going to be a, a you know, there's going to be a build up until the return of Messiah and all those things that have to have the beginning of sorrows, the great tribulation. But before the end comes, there's going to be the lake of fire and everybody's going to end up in here. And that's what this is talking about. The, the, the sinner is not going to be destroyed. So get that out of your head until after the thousand year reign because at the great white throne judgment they're either going to go into the lake of fire or they're going to go into the kingdom. So you have to make sure that you understand again, this is talking about something that already happened but it happened once, it happened again, it's going to come to a final conflict. Com uh, so you got to make sure you understand the conclusion of Go ahead, brother. Verse 10. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened and is going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. See, and that's just where we left off in, in uh, Luke chapter 21, verse 25. He's given that same prophecy that was given back there. You see how how prophecy is secular and how it gets fulfilled over and over again. And our Messiah points these things out, but subtly. Okay, and then it says, "Men's heart failing." We just read that them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, the planet, the whole earth. Okay, for the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. Now, you got to understand that the complete complexity of how prophecy works and how it comes to its final conflict everything starts one way and ends up another it, when God created the heavens and the earth on the fourth day he created the sun the moon the stars and everything that was in them now at the final conclusion when heaven and earth burns up Okay, those things are going to be shaken. They're going to be destroyed. And they're not going to be necessary anymore because in Revelation chapter 21, it says that the Father and the Lamb will be the light thereof. Okay, and that's where you have to be able to put all of Scripture together. Prophecy is secular and it continues to be fulfilled as we read. And that's why everything our Messiah relates to things that already happen and things to come. That's why he teaches in parables as well. And nothing's new under the sun. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now, obviously there's going to be signs in the heavens where we're going to see the heavens and the earth and everything shaken in the sky. We're going to see that. Matter of fact, we've been seeing a lot of signs in the heavens in the last couple of years. All the uh, lunar and solar eclipses, all these things are signs in the heavens. Okay? These things are putting out. Everybody thinks that that's the end is getting ready to come based on these signs and wonders. But there's a lot more things yet have to be fulfilled before our Messiah returns and before the end can come. And when these things begin to come to pass or take place, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draws near. Now let's talk about when our Messiah returns and those that are called and that are chosen in the first resurrection, their redemption is near. Because those that are in the grave shall meet their, our Messiah in the air. That's what he's talking about. But then in verse 29, he says, And he spake to them a parable. Behold, the fig tree and all the trees, not just the fig tree, when they now shoot forth, you see and know of your own selves that summer is now near and at hand. Okay, So what he's saying is when you see all these things happen, 
you'll know when the end is coming. You can't predict the day and the hour. There's too many variables in Scripture. There's too many times things have to be fulfilled before the end comes. Okay, So we have to make sure that we're rightly discerning those signs by where we are when we see these things happening. So likewise you, when you see these things come to pass, know you that the kingdom of Elohim is near at hand. Okay, remember a day is as a thousand years. By the time the Messiah returns, it's going to go by very quickly because we're going to be spirit at that time if we're in that first resurrection. And the kingdom of Elohim will be near at hand. Verse 32, truly or verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. A lot of people think that because he said that, that when the next generation of men came along, that that prophecy failed. That's not true at all. He's talking about the generation of the rule of man on earth. That's what he's talking about. That's the generation. Okay, it's not a human generation. The time from when the Messiah ascended until he comes back, and that'll be the end of that 6,000 years, and the end of that particular part of the prophecy. Then verse 33 says, heaven and earth shall pass away. Is that going to pass away before the millennium or after the millennium? After the millennium. Okay, no doubt about it. But heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. And take heed to yourself, at least at any time, your hearts be overcharged with suffer, suffering and drunkenness and, and cares of this life. And so that day come upon you unaware. Come on you like a thief in the night. Remember, he that endures to the end shall be saved. So don't be distressed by the signs in the heavens, nor what's going on overseas, even in Jerusalem, because the end is not yet, folks. Okay? For as a snare shall it come on you, them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Okay? Because that's talking about, again, the great white throne judgment. That's when the, it's going to come on all the inhabitants of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore, and pray always that you be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass. Now, those that are in the first resurrection are going to escape the fire. They're not going to end up with the second death. has no power over them. And that's what this is talking about. Watch ye therefore, and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things. You're not going to escape the great tribulation if you're living. But you're going to escape the lake of fire if you continue in God's commandments until the end. The end of your life or when the Messiah returns. All these things shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. And in the day, and in, and in the daytime, our Messiah, he was teaching in the temple. And at night he went out and abode in the mount that is called the Mount of Olives. And all the people came early in the morning to hear to him in the temple or to hear him. Now, I wanted to stop there because this is a whole new train of thought. Got it a little shorter than I usually do, but we covered a lot of scripture. Hopefully that people are edified. And may, we be, may you be blessed until we, get, we return again on the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles, which will be Tuesday, a Monday night going into Tuesday.